So if you would, turn your Bibles to John chapter 19, John chapter 19, verse 38 through 42. Once you get there, if you would stand to your feet. Remember I told you you would sit down for 2.5 seconds? All right, your 2.5 seconds. That was a little bit longer. It's Easter, it's Resurrection Sunday, so I gave you a few more minutes. Um, but if you would, once you get to John chapter 19, verse 38, if you would stand to your feet this morning. We also have outlines available. We also have outlines available. And so I'm a teaching pastor. And so I like to teach the word of God for what the word of God says. And so if you want to follow along on the outline, you can. Um, you can write in the points and write in everything. And so if you need one, just kind of just slip your hand up and our team will get you one. And so John chapter 19, verse 38 through 42. Is everyone there yet? Everybody say ready if you're there. You say wait on me if you need me to wait on you. All right, I'm not going to wait on you because the scripture is on the screen. And so if you did not bring your Bible, it is okay. It is okay. We're not going to judge you here and say, well, you should have brought your paper Bible. No, it's okay. But for those of you who did bring your paper Bible, I got a gift for you all. Who brought their paper Bible? All right. It's Chick-fil-A on me today, okay? Yeah, I had to think about it. Y'all was about to go to Chick-fil-A one, y'all. Yeah, I was like, Pastor Jay paying for our Chick-fil-A. It's on me today, y'all. It's on me. Chick-fil-A on me today. So John chapter 19, verse 38 through 42. It's okay to laugh in church, y'all. It's okay to laugh in church. This is what the scripture says. It says, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus and Pilate granted him permission, so he came and took away his body. And Nicodemus also, who first had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, weighing about a hundred pounds. So Jesus has some secret, some secret follow, some secret followers. Joseph and, and Nicodemus. They were a part of. Let me just give you some context. They were a part of the Sanhedrin. Um, they were a part of the Pharisee Sadducee sect, and so. They believed in Christ, but they had to do it secretly because they didn't want to get ex they, they didn't want to get put out of what they were in. And so this is what the scripture says, verse 40. So they took Jesus body and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, aromatics, as is the Jews customary way to prepare for burial. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever yet been laid. So there, because of the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus. Where did they lay Jesus? They laid Jesus in the tomb that was in the garden. I want to use for a topic this morning, the art of the garden. Everybody say, the art, the art. of the garden. Of the Let's look from God and pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We honor you. I pray that you move Lester Bell Jr. out of the way, and that you allow Holy Spirit to speak through me to your people. God, we thank you, Lord God, for each and every person, Lord God, that is on this campus, Lord God, whether they are in um, the auditorium or whether they are in the den, Lord God. Allow this message to speak to their heart. Allow this message to penetrate their heart, Lord God. So we thank you, we love you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As you sit down, say the art, the art of, the garden. of the garden. And turn to your neighbor, say the art, the art of, the garden. of the garden. Now turn to the other person you didn't choose first. And say the art, the art of the garden. Hey, it's okay to not be the first pick. It's okay. It's okay. The second pick is still good. And so I want to start off this preaching presentation with this quote. It's from an unknown author. He says this. He says, your body is not a machine, but a garden to be tended. Your body is not a machine, but a garden to be tended. A lot of times we treat our bodies as machines and not our bodies as gardens. What do I mean by that? I mean this. I mean we put our body through all of these things. Our body, um, we, we, we give our body a lot of things, a lot of vices that aren't helpful for our body. And we think it's a machine, but actually your, your body is a garden. And so when you think of gardens, what do you think of? You think of seeds, you think of flowers, you think of water, you think of fruit, you think of growth, you think of beauty. And guess what? When you think of gardens, you think of serenity, don't you? You've heard of serenity gardens, right? You've seen those two together, serenity gardens. 
And so when you, when you think of gardens, you think of it, of it in that way. But when you think of your heart, you also think of seeds, you think of blood, you think of water, you think of fruit, you think of growth, you think of beauty. And guess what? You think of serenity in your heart as well, don't you? You think of peace in your heart as well. And so today I want us to help, help you understand that a garden and your heart have similarities, and I want us to lean into that today. Did you hear what I just said? Your gar a garden and your heart have similarities, and I want us to lean into that today. And so listen, when you were first being formed, one of the first organs to form in you is your heart. Hallelujah. And so your heart is one of the first things, because your heart produces, your heart produces blood, right? And your heart sends that blood to, to, to your cardiovascular, um, to your cardiovascular system. And so why is your heart similar to a garden? I know some of you are probably like, how is that even possible? Your heart is similar to a garden because just as a garden can produce beauty, so can your heart. Amen. Let me say that again. Your heart is simil similar to a garden because just as a garden can produce beauty, so can your heart. So what do I mean by that? Let's go to Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Are y'all tracking with me so far? Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says this. It says, the upright, honorable, intrinsically good man out of the good treasure stored in his heart produces what is upright, honorable, and intrinsically good. And the evil man out of the evil storehouse brings forth that which is depraved, wicked, and intrinsically evil. For out of the abundance, overflow of the heart, guess what? The mouth speaks. And so you can always tell what's in someone's heart by what they say from their mouth. Amen. So if someone says something to you that goes that sideways or someone says something to you that's not healthy or that's not good for you, you can always tell what's in their heart because they are saying they're going to say it through their mouth. Right. See, a lot of times people try to put on this facade like they can block what's in their heart. But you can always see what's in a heart because someone will always let you know by their words what's in their heart. And so listen, gardens produce and your heart produces as well. Say that with me. Gardens produce and my heart produces as well. And so, and so I'm not to the point yet, but I want to give you this, this first intro so that we can understand where we're going with this thing, all right? And so we have to understand that there is a major difference between a dry garden and a well-watered garden. Now, how many of you would love to, um, how many of you would garner serenity from a dry garden? Not many people in this room, because guess what? When it's dry, plants are dead, they're laying on the ground. I got any, um, any horticulturists in the, in the house? My, I know my wife is one. And so um, I know some other people, okay, we got another, okay, raise your hand up. It's okay. You're like, should I raise my hand up or not? I don't want nobody to know I'm into gardens. It's a good thing to be into gardens, right? It's a good thing to be in a garden. And so, and so my, garden, my gardeners, there's a major difference between a dry garden and a well-watered garden, right? Because a dry garden, it does not produce and it easily attracts fungus that kills the plants, right? And so we, me, and, me and Lady Pilar have talked about funguses and she's, she's had a whole bunch of flowers and she's grown in her green thumb and grown in her garden making. Um, and I'm going to keep investing in that because that's something that she likes to do. Even though sometimes the flowers may not make it, I'm going to still invest into it. And so, and so, yeah. And so, and so dry gardens, they don't produce. And so your heart can be likened to this because when your heart is dry, you are not able to produce peace and joy because you have allowed skepticism and doubt to enter your heart. So when your heart is dry, because the enemy wants your heart to be dry, if the enemy can have your heart dry, guess what happens? He can keep you from receiving peace. He can keep you from receiving love. He can keep you from receiving joy because your heart is dry because you, you, become, you become calloused. And when you become calloused, then guess what happens? You hurt other people. And so that's what happens with a dry heart. That's what happens with a dry garden. But there's, there, there is another side to that. Everybody say there's another side. There's another side. And so a well-watered garden produces beauty. 
a well-watered garden produces beauty. So if you, I know you walked beside our, on the sidewalk, and you've seen the flowers, and aren't you captured by those, those beautiful colors of the flowers, right? That's because that has been well-watered, and that's because that has been tended to. And see, a well-watered garden and a well-watered heart, it has a connection with Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit is representative of water. Because what does Holy Spirit do? Holy Spirit refreshes us. Holy Spirit quenches our spiritual thirst. Holy Spirit cleanses us. And Holy Spirit brings forth life wherever he flows. That's why you have to walk with God. Because when you walk with God, he'll lead you. He'll talk to you. And he'll lead you in a way that will help you to not be dry. So let's go to John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. Are y'all tracking with me so far? Good. Are y'all tracking with me, Dean? I know I can't hear you, but I'm going to just imagine that y'all said yes over there. Somebody waved at me or something. And so this is what it says in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. It says, it says, now on the final and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried in a loud voice, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, who cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously. Now, it doesn't stop. It says shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. And verse 39 says this, but he was speaking here of the spirit whom those who believe trusted had faith in him were afterward to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified, raised to honor. And so that was when Jesus was here. But Holy Spirit is available now. And Holy Spirit wants to live in you. He wants to reign in you. He wants to he wants to abide in you. Because, listen, when you allow your heart to be watered by Holy Spirit, your life will produce beauty. See, a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, sometimes, have you ever seen somebody and you just like, man, I just got to be around that person because of what they are producing. They're producing beauty. They're not just saying that I'm kingdom or I'm this or I'm that and not producing anything. They are actually producing something. And so we like to be around those type of people who, who produce. We like to be around those people. Let me, let me take it to Gen Z who have good vibes, right? Gen Z, we like to be around people who have good vibes. Gen Z, talk to me. Y'all here, right? Okay. Gen Z, like, yeah, yeah, good vibes, good energy. Yeah, whatever you say, Pastor. Whatever you say, man, in purple suit. And so let's go to Joel chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. Let's go to Joel chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. And this is what the scripture says. It says this. It says, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he gives you the former or early rain in just measure and in righteousness, and he causes you to come, it causes to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain as before. See, a lot of times when we look at rain, we look at rain as something that is not good. We've seen the song, rain, rain, go away, come again another day. But rain is actually good for your life. Because rain, when rain comes, it actually washes away what is not like God. When rain comes, it actually clears your path for you to be able to see where you need to go. But a lot of times we're trying to, we're trying to, no, don't rain, don't rain. We got this and we got to do this and we got to do this and don't rain on my plans and don't do this and don't do that. But when it rains, when it, ra when Holy, when, when it rains, when Holy Spirit falls upon your life afresh, then he, he has the ability to clear your path. He has the ability to lead you on the path. The scripture says the steps of a good man are what? Ordered by the Lord. And so in order for the steps of a good man to be ordered by the Lord, then that means that we have to allow Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us because Holy Spirit is representative of water. Everybody say that with me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. is representative of water. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And we want to take it to back to where it started. Now, your homework today, we give homework here. They probably like, man, I ain't coming back to that church because they give homework. But Genesis, I want you to read the first chapter of Genesis when you get home. Just chapter one, just chapter two. Read that when you get home, okay? So we're going to fast forward to fast forward to Genesis chapter two, verse 15. Everybody there? Say ready. ready. This is what the scripture says. And the Lord God 
took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and guard and keep it. So this is where we see the garden initially announced in the beginning. And so if you're writing notes, I want you to write this down. God put man in the garden so that he could have fellowship with him. God put man in the garden so that man could have fellowship with God. See, God loves you so much that he created the world in stages to best suit you. And so God did not just throw you and throw us into the world. Like, okay, well, let me make man in my image and likeness and let me, boom, throw him into the world. No, he went through stages to build the world so that the world was suitable for man when the man got there. See, aren't you glad that God loves you enough to already order what's in front of you? And so he makes suitable everything that is in front of you so that when you get there, it's suitable for you. And see, we serve a God that loves us that much to say, you know what, let me, let me go ahead of them, let me go before them, and let me set things up in a way so that when they get to that place, they're not stressed, they're not full of anxiety, they're not full of fear, they're not full of depression, because guess what? I've already set up a place of peace for them. And so when God created the garden for man, he created it in a way that would sustain him. He created it in a way that would sustain him. And see, God knows that only he can fill the void of your heart and be able to sustain you. See, a lot of us, sometimes we're trying to fill the void in our heart with other things. We're trying to fill the void with um, money. We're trying to fill the void with relationships. We're trying to fill the void um, with, with, with drugs, possibly, with alcohol. We're trying to fill that void. But Holy Spirit, God is the only person who can fill the void of your heart. God, there's a seat in your heart that only God can fill. And when you allow God to fill that seat in your heart, then your life, you will see your life blossom. You will see your life produce beauty because you have allowed God to, to occupy that seat. But a lot of times we're trying to do all of this work. We're trying to make all of this money and then we get it. And then it's like something is missing here. And who, what is, who is that that is missing? That is God that is missing. And only God can feel, say that with me, only God can feel, God can feel that, void that void in my heart. In my heart. And see, oftentimes we think we know what is best for ourselves and we don't have a relationship with God. And guess what it creates? It creates malnourishment. And so we become malnourished because we are not in fellowship with God. But God wants to have a relationship with you. That's why he sent his son to die for you so that you could have a relationship with him so that he could direct your steps. So let's go to Psalm chapter one, Psalm chapter one, verse one through four. Y'all tracking with me? Everybody tracking with me? Good, 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 good. Psalm chapter one. I'm going to read verses one through four. Sounds like somebody's uh, go to sleep alarm is, is going off. It's alarm for the second service. OK, prophecy, prophesy. <laughs> I need to speed up then. That's what you're telling me. All right. I get it. I, I, I read the undertones there. Everybody agree and I like, Pastor Jay, you need to speed up. They done looked at my timer already. You only got these many minutes left. Now everybody look back at the wall. Like, How many minutes he got left? Everybody at Psalm chapter one, verse one through four. This is what the scripture says. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Everybody say day and night. Day and night. That person, this is this scripture I want to get to, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. See, God wants you to go through a season of life, and not just a season of life. He wants your life to look like whatever you do prospers. Whatever you put your hands to prospers. But guess what you have to do? You have to make sure that you are in alignment with God. You have to be like a tree planted by the streams of living water. And so the scripture says this, not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. So what is chaff? Chaff is the part that is not used. So chaff, when it's, chaff is basically dry. And so it has the ability to, to, to fly away. And so when your heart is dry, 
when you are in a dry season of life, guess what happens? You have the ability to what? Fly away. And so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. Jeremiah verse 29, verse 13. And this is what the scripture says. It says, then you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a vital necessity. See, see, God has to be a vital necessity to you because you can't do life without him anyway. And for those of us, for those of us who have tried to do life without him, we, we, we got to be extremely smart. Because I, me and Lady Pilar were talking about this last night. You know, you, for me, you can't tell me that God is not real because... Who else is holding the clouds in the sky? Who else is holding the stars in place? Who else is holding the moon in place? Who else is holding the sun in place? Who else is holding the galaxies in place? There, there's things that we don't even see that God is holding in place. Even in your life, there's things in your life that God is holding in place that you don't even see. So you can't, you can't tell me that God is, is not real because God is holding this thing in place. And if God said, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm going to let you hold it in place. We, we, we will fall to pieces. As soon, as soon as he said, all right, I'm going to let you, as soon as he said that, boom, everything will fall to pieces. And so you can't tell me that God is real because God is real because he's holding things in place in your life that you don't even see. And so it says, it says, and require me as, an, as a vital necessity and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So God is not looking for a partialness of your heart. And a lot of times we just want to give God, God, God okay, okay, God, I will give you this little section right here because I want to protect my traumas. I want to protect my hurts. I want to protect my pain. I want to protect these things. And so I'm, going to, I'm just going to give you this small portion, God, and I'm going to handle the rest. But God wants your whole heart. Everybody say whole heart. Whole heart. And that leads me to my next point, which is this. The condition of your heart determines your level of receive. When I say garden and heart, they, they are synonymous here, garden and heart. So the condition of your heart determines the level of your receive. So let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 23. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 23. And the scripture says this, it says, listen then to the meaning of the parable of the sower. While anyone is hearing the word of the kingdom and does not grasp and comprehend it, the evil one comes and snatches away that what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the roadside. Okay? So, so let me give you, some, let me give you some, some, some context here, right? So the context is that there was some seed sown on good ground. There was some seed not sown on not so good ground. There was some seed sown and the birds came and ate it up. And so this is Jesus, this is Jesus describing what the parable means. And the scripture says this, it says, as for what was sown on the thin, rocky soil, this is he, this is he who hears the word and at once welcomes and accepts it with joy. Yet it has no root in him, but it is temporary and constant lasts but a little while, and when affliction or trouble or persecution comes on account of the word, at once he is caused to stumble, he is repelled and begins to distrust and desert him whom he ought to trust and obey, and he falls away. All right? So, where you, did you know that seeds are, are phototrophic and gravitrophic? Okay, you're probably like, that's the nerd in him coming out. It is. So seeds, they have to grow down first in order for them to grow up. Right? So that's why it's important for you to handle things in seed form as opposed to harvest form. Because when it gets to harvest form, it's harder to, it's harder to uh, combat. So, so seeds, they have to grow down first, and they have to grow roots first. Because when those seeds grow down, they grow. So, so what, you see, what you see on the, what you see on the, on the, on the tree, that seed has first went down first. And so it's, it's created a root system. Have you ever, have you ever uh, tried to cut a tree down, and then there were a bunch of roots, then those roots up, up, uprooted other things, right? That's because that tree has, has created a root system. 
And that root system is where, where the tree gets all of its nutrients from. So the, the tree gets its nutrients from the soil. It gets its nutrients from the water. And so it grows down first. But the tree also grows up too. So it grows up because it's attracted to the light. So your life should resemble that of a seed. It should grow down first. You should humble yourself. And then you should also be attracted to the light. Who is the light? Jesus is the light. God is light. God is life. God is love. So your life should grow down and your life should grow up as well. But you have to have a firm foundation. You have to make sure that your soul is anchored in God. Because if your soul is not anchored in God, when persecution comes, what happens is you will start to you will start to question the Bible. And a lot of times with 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 Google nomics and people having the ability to search Google to find some things on Wikipedia that's not true about the word of God. You have to be mindful of that because they people will search something on Google counted as truth. It, everything you read on the internet is not true. Everything you read on social media is not true. So that's why you have to have a filter to put your truth through. Who is that filter that you put your truth through? Jesus is the filter that you put the truth through. But if you never put the truth through him, then you're going to just take whatever comes. And you're going to be tossed and you're going to be too, to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every spirit and wind of doctrine. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Oh, somebody said this and it was good. But if that does not align with the word of God, is it good? Just information. And so you have to make sure that it aligns with the word of God. You have to make sure that it aligns with truth. Somebody say, make sure, make sure. It, aligns it aligns with truth. Because guess what? If it does not align with truth, you need to. My dad used to say this. I always take a rake and a pitchfork with you. What does that mean? Rake in what you can use. Pitch out what you can't use. If it does not align with truth, pitch it out. If someone says something to you that, that is not in the scripture. And that's why, that's, why, that's why my prayer is that when I'm ministering, that I minister to you the word of God. Because I want you to know the true, unadulterated truth and word of God. I don't want you to know my opinion because my opinion is not going to save you. Only God can save you. And so we want to make sure that we preach the gospel. Everybody say preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. So verse 22 says this. It says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the pleasure and delight and glamour and deceitfulness of riches choke and suffocate the word and it yields no fruit. See, your life should be yielding fruit. People should be able to come to your tree and pick fruit from your tree. People should not be malnourished by your actions, by your energy, by what you say to them, by what you think about them. People should be able to say, you know what, I'm a, I'm a go I can go to that tree and I can be fulfilled. Not I go to that tree and I feel like I'm being taken away from. And so you should produce fruit. Everybody say fruit. And verse 23 says this, as for what was sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and grasps and comprehends it. He indeed bears fruit and yields one cake a hundred times as much was sown. So that seed has the ability to produce a hundred times more than what was sown. And it says in another 60 times as much and in another 30. So you should be producing. So my question to you is, what is your heart producing? What is your garden producing? She almost made it. She almost, I was going to let her come up here and preach. Hey, she can come up here and preach with me. And we, can, we can make it work. We'll make it work. We make it. Hey, like I have a baby boy. Too. If he was in here, he would probably be up here. Yeah, you're right. I did used to do it. My mom is over there testifying, y'all. Don't listen to her. All right, so if you're writing notes, I want you to write this down. What was lost in the garden through Adam was gained in the garden through Christ. What was lost in the garden through Adam was gained through the garden through Christ. What do I mean by that? Let's go to John chapter 19, verse 41 through 42. It says this. It says, now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever yet been laid. And so let me give you some just some context around this garden, right? So Joseph of Arimathea, he was a wealthy man, and he had a tomb 
in a garden, right? So the mindset around it was this, that when they went to tend the garden to know that life does not last forever, but what you are producing in the here and now should be that of beauty. And so they always had a contrast when they went to the garden, they would also see the tomb as well. And so they would make sure that when, when, when they, they held in contrast, when I see this garden, when I see this tomb, I know that I'm not going to be here forever. So what am I producing? So my question to you, I'm not trying to scare you. You're not going to be, I'm not going to be here forever. You're not going to be here forever. But what are you producing while you are here? And so are you producing something that will, that will benefit to the peace and the love and joy of other people? Or are you producing something that will be a detriment to that person's peace, to that person's joy, to that person's love? And so it's important to understand what am I producing? And I want you to, I want you to ask yourself that on your drive home when you leave 101 Crayola Lane. I want you to ask yourself this, what am I producing? Am, am, am I repelling people from me? Are, are people uh, not attracted to the light in me? The scripture says, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven, not glorify you. And so the question is, what are you producing? Somebody say, what are you producing? And so I just want to give you some context there of, of, of why the tomb was in the garden. Because wealthy people, they had their tomb in the garden. Because they wanted to see Okay, this is what I'm producing. I know I'm not going to be here forever. And so I want to produce something that's of beauty so that when I leave here, then beauty still is here. Because people will remember, pe people will forget what you said. They will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So how are you making people feel? You're making people feel good. You're making people feel bad. And that's, that's, the, that's the question you have to ask yourself. You have, you have to ask yourself that. Like, how, how, how? How am I? How am I responding and interacting? And uh, how how am I? How am I with people? And so, listen. So, so in the Garden of Eden, death and the grave first received their power. But in the Garden Jesus was buried in, death and the grave are conquered, disarmed, and triumphed over. So, listen. The fall may may have took place in the Garden, but the redeemed also took place in the Garden. Aren't we glad that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us before we were even born? Yes. So before you were even a thought, before your parents were even a thought, before their parents were even a thought, God sent his son to die for you because he loves you that much. And so God was creating the perfect situation for you before you were even born. And so we have to understand and we have to, to find peace and joy in knowing that God loves us enough to send his son to die for us before we were even a thought. And so what type of seeds should we sow in our heart? What type of seeds should we sow in our heart? The first type of seed that we should sow, sow in our heart is this. We should plant seeds of God's word. We should plant seeds of God's word. So in order for us to know who God is, we need to know where God says he says. We need to, know, we need to go to where God says he is, which is I am. So we need to go to the scripture. We are not I am, God is I am. God is the I am that I am, not, not us. So that means that we need to go to find out what the scripture says about who God is. If we never go to the scripture, how can we, if, how can, listen, if you were in a class and you never read the book for the class, now some of us have done that, then when the test comes, then you don't know what the test is about because you haven't taken the time to read what was in the book. And so when, when persecution comes, if you have not read what's in the book, then you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna automatically take what somebody else says. But here at Momentum, I want you to read the word for yourself. You don't got to wait for me to read the word. To, you don't got to wait till Sunday to read the word. You can read. You can study to show yourself approved. And so when you study, then you can, when you come and, and hear the word, then that word should unlock something in you. It, it, should, it, should, it should align with something in you. You should say, you know what, I read that this week. And, and that, that connected with my spirit. And so everybody say, plant seeds of God's word. What, what, what else type of seeds should we plant 
in our heart. We should plant seeds of growth. Everybody say plant seeds of growth. Plant seeds of growth. What do I mean by that? We should be planting seeds in our life that, in, that inspire growth in our life. We should inspire growth in our life. So when growth happens in our life, when I get better, you get better. When you get better, I get better because I planted seeds of growth. So everybody say plant seeds of growth. Plant seeds of growth. What other type of seeds should we plant? We should plant seeds of goodwill. Everybody say plant seeds of goodwill. Plant seeds of goodwill. So that means that we, we should have goodwill benefit towards one another. We, 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 sh we should not be fighting one another. When we value one another, when I value you, when you value me, guess what happens? Then I can plant seeds into your life and you can plant seeds into my life of goodwill. Because I value. See, you are a person of value. Say that with me. I am, I am a person of value. So everybody say plant seeds of goodwill. Plant seeds of goodwill. Lastly, this one is my favorite. We need to plant seeds of gratefulness. Everybody say plant seeds of gratefulness. Plant seeds of gratefulness. See, when you become grateful for what God has done in your life, then God can actually bring more into your life. A lot of times we want more. God, give me more. Give me more. I want this God. I want this God. I want this God. I want this God. And I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. But instead of saying, God, I'm grateful. Thank you for, thank you for what you blessed me with. God, when the last time you was in your car and you said, God, thank you. When, the la when, the la when was the last time that you walked or that you talked or that you were able to see you say, you know what? God, thank you. And it doesn't have to be. See, a lot of times we think that we just have to thank God for the big things. No, it can, it can be something as minute as, God, thank you for allowing my subconscious mind to tell my heart to beat. Yeah. Now, you're probably like, what? <laughs> See, are you telling your heart to beat right now? You're not. Your, your subconscious function, your subconscious mind is telling your heart to beat. And so what type of seeds should we sow in our heart? We should plant seeds of God's word. Everybody say plant seeds of God's word. Plant seeds of God's word. Everybody say plant seeds of growth. Plant seeds of growth. Everybody say plant seeds of goodwill. And everybody say, plant seeds of gratefulness. Plant seeds of gratefulness. This is how you tend to the garden, which is your heart. Amen? Amen. Let's look from God in prayer.